This is not a clock. This is a family member. It has a name, grandmother or grandfather. It has a brain with gears that move and work. It has a heart that keeps time deep in its chest. It has feet that allow it to stand. It has a face which we may gaze upon. It has hands that gesture. It has a voice, a sound that speaks to us. It is a physical presence in our homes, participating in our domestic rituals. It watches us grow. This is not a clock. This is a family member. This is not a clock. This is a ruler. It has an ornate crown atop its head like a monarch. It is housed in a decorative palace with brass ornamentation, carved designs throughout its body, and classical elements, columns framing its entrance, mounts supporting its crown. It dictates out to us its subjects from its palace. We set our lives by the clock. We know when to have tea when it chimes a certain time. We do not rule it. It rules us. This is not a clock. This is a ruler. This is not a clock. This is a universe. The instrument inside the clock tracks seconds, minutes, and days, displaying them on its face of concentric and layered circles. Think about celestial charts and the orbits of planets. Near the top, we see a lunar cycle and the two hemispheres of the Earth. Notice, though, that the numbers that encircle the hands are all directed towards the center. The clock does not address us, standing upright in front of it, but directs itself to its own center. It is autonomous, whole. This is not a clock. This is a universe. This is not a chest. This is a contract. It was given to Elizabeth George in 1779 by Abraham Merkham. She was 17 and he was 25. They had a six-year promise before their wedding until 1785. This is not a chest, this is a contract. When this chest arrived at Elizabeth's house, she would have been granted the key to it. She would have had complete autonomy to open the chest and put linens and blankets inside of it in preparation for her marriage household. This is not a chest, it's a contract. However, this chest is not only a sign of Elizabeth's obligation, but also a symbol of hope for the future. The central image on the front is of two kissing squirrels resting on a heart, an image of love. The circular images are mirror images of each other, forming two halves of a whole. While they may seem decorative, they are also symbols of the life Elizabeth and Abraham will have together when they marry. The images evoke hopes for a fruitful future, their flowering love producing children and continued fertility. Abraham seals this promise with the signing of his name over the medallions. This is not a fire screen. This is a canvas. Fire screens were typically used to block the heat from fireplaces so that a lady sitting in front of the fire could be warm without turning red, in a time where it was fashionable to look as pale as porcelain. Women would need to sit by the fireplace as a light source for needlework. The hearth was a family gathering place and a woman would often find herself in front of the light and the heat. Wealthy families commissioned master woodworkers to construct household furniture, including adjustable fire screens. The needlework stretched in the frame, however, was often created by the lady of the house. This showcased her skill and patience to all that visited the estate. So why a canvas? Well, not a literal canvas, but an imaginary space to create. An outlet in which a woman could pose herself to her advantage. In a similar way, an artist would use a framing device to compose a portrait. This elevated a woman's needlework to the status of a master painter. Because she did the needlework, she is both the artist and the model. <laughs>